the Oxford Public Schools School Committee meeting of Monday, March 14th, 2022 at 6 p.m. Please note, face coverings and masks are optional in all school buildings until further notice. Regular school committee meetings are videotaped by Oxford Cable Access and broadcast live on the town's public access educational cable channel 194 only. Video recordings may be viewed subsequent to the live broadcast via the town's YouTube channel, which may be accessed from either the town of Oxford website or the Oxford Public School website. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call the meeting to order. I'd also like to open the floor to public comment. Comments are limited, limited to topics relating to school business. Speakers must identify themselves by name and address and will be allowed to speak for up to three minutes. Although the school committee may hear comments on unanticipated topics, Discussion or action on topics not specifically listed on the agenda will be postponed until a further a future meeting date. So public comment is open. Seeing and hearing no one from the public, we are going to close public comment. And we'll go right to special uh, presentations. Uh, so Suzanne Kelly, the registrar, if you would like to come forward, uh, give us an update on student enrollment. So um, my update tonight is about a report that the state requires. It's called School Attending Children. And the purpose of this report is to make sure that uh, we as a district are aware of where all of the students belonging to any resident, um, you know, parents that live in town, uh, where they are attending. So we collect this data beginning in, well, we start sending out requests in December, and the data is as of uh, the first business day of January, so it's as of January 3rd this year, and um, we collect it from private, public, and vocational schools, as well as the collaborative schools. Um, so this is from our, this is our fiscal FY22 um, school year and if you look at your report I've um, included the first page is the report that is sent to DESE. Um, so our first column is the Oxford Public Schools. We have 1,391 students who are residents of the town of Oxford. Um, next is our vocational schools. We have 142 residents who are attending a vocational school. Most of that is Bay Path. Um, collaboratives are mostly our special ed out of district students. The next column is charter schools. That number has jumped this year from previous years. Um, but there are still, you know, there are 31 students in that column. Uh, following column is anyone that has school choice out to any other public school, such as Auburn, Charlton, um, Sutton, etc. cetera. Um, homeschool students this year, we have 47. And um, for in-state, private, or parochial schools, we have 100 students. That also includes some of our special ed students who are attending a private school. Uh, the next column is out-of-state, private, parochial, and again, that is a couple of those are special ed students attending out-of-state out schools, but the, bu <coughs> the bulk of those are at, um, oh my word, I forgot the name of the school. Marianapolis, thank you. Marianapolis in Connecticut. Any questions on the first? Anybody have any questions about? Nope. Okay. Um, Page two does a, it's just a breakdown by grade, by school, and that's how we came up with the numbers that um, we report to the state. So we send a letter out to each of these schools. Uh, we send out a letter to many schools. These are the schools that responded that they had students that live in um, Oxford. I almost said my town. Um, if you go to page three, um, that, I pull out Bay Path because it makes the other chart look 
it's very hard to read the other chart if Bay Path is in there. 142 students are attending um, Bay Path this year. Um, last year we were at 130, uh, but we had a lot more freshmen who were invited to attend. So um, that number jumped just a little bit. Um, page four is basically a bar chart of all the other schools and the numbers of students attending. And then the last page is our homeschool. So last year we had 52 students homeschooling, and this year, as of February 9th, which is when I started collecting this data, we had 47. And these numbers are, are kept in the superintendent's office. Anybody? I just want to thank you. This is really, really great data. Um, I guess two things that jump out at me is <clears throat> that kindergarten, first, second, third, the number bumps up, but fourth, like those numbers total that we have, like just total, kids are low. Those are really low when you compare them to fifth grade to twelfth. And that ninth grade class I didn't realize it was that big I mean if 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 we had everybody in the school there'd be 179 kids in that ninth grade that's a lot of kids yeah I didn't realize that number was that high yeah there's a lot of bubbles in I, <clears throat> it's it's strange you don't know where there's going to be a bubble our kindergarten is seems to be a bubble um, like I said fifth grade is 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 very big even even fifth grade attending in Oxford is bigger than a lot of the other grades so uh, as far as the bubbles when when uh you know how we're handling them but um yeah but there are a lot of kids that are in some of those grades yeah i mean and like i said like kindergarten to, through fourth i mean 105 70 these are just oxford kids 100 that are in our schools mm -hmm. 77 100 112 102 and that's just that's like elementary age when you start getting older and you lose you know kids go to bay path or Catholic schools, private schools, and those numbers are really alarming. Mm -hmm. Alarming, I don't know if that's yeah. jumping out anybody else, but. Well, it's always been the trend that fifth grade has been a very large class, and they don't necessarily always get the smaller class sizes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they're, you know, they're a challenging class because they haven't had the luxury of having those smaller classes. I've always advocated for the fact that fifth grade, I feel, should have a little bit more smaller class sizes i believe the smallest class size and i would love to be corrected if i'm wrong is 25 for that fifth grade class and that's a large class i mean comparatively to what we are seeing these days i mean it's not like you know i do remember having class sizes in the 30s and higher way back when but now we know better and so i think we do better and um well, i think way back when too there was a different mindset of the students and the, and the parents but that's that's not my purview <laughs> no but I do I know I, I came from classes of 30 as well right but and we didn't talk or it's not ideal no no I mean if you just look at if you look at the, the the first grade currently 77 kids from Oxford and that's 85 it's 86 percent of the kids are in Oxford but then you look at like ninth grade 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, we're really only in the high 50s. So if you lose 25% of that 77, I mean, you're talking 60 kids? Small class. 55 yeah. kids? Yeah. Those numbers are alarming. And that's happening across the state, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that grade level is low. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. We thought, right. we thought last year it had to do with just people not coming to kindergarten. We thought our numbers would jump this year in first grade across the state, but it hasn't oh so that's a trend across the state okay yeah, i don't know if that's a little more comfortable less now. people are having children i don't know if the yeah. census agrees with that or not <laughs> yeah that's what we see that's been the, the trend i don't know i mean off topic we're you know we're right now doing kindergarten registration but we i don't have numbers for that but you know that's you know off topic but yeah. we don't we have no idea what's going to come for kindergarten yeah. until it comes right yeah well, anything else? Thank you very much. Like I said, that's great data. I love that.
All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, Kristen Miller, our interim S director of student services and special ed, going to give us an update. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so you have your packets. Um, so the Student Services and Special Education Department is currently serving 311 special education students on IEPs, 83 students on Section 504 plans, and 23 English language learners. Um, I would like to take a minute and thank all the staff for not only their hard work, but their contributions to this newsletter. Um, it's a very busy time of year, so I appreciated their contributions. And I can say that we're so proud and impressed by all that they do on a daily basis. Um, so we start with our littles, our adorable little ones, in the integrated preschool program. Um, we've been fortunate to have welcomed a new early childhood teacher, Miss Nikki. Um, she's come to us from Framingham with extensive experience in pre-K to two, um, teaching pre-K to two. Um, and she's certainly joined at a fun-filled time when they're learning about Dr. Seuss and moving on to um, fairy tales. As the older students are preparing for graduation and moving on to kindergarten, our preschool teachers and related service staff will be screening the new little ones to join our program next school year. And the preschool team is always busy, but they provide such a fun and learning atmosphere. Um, we move up to grade one at Chafee, and we see the wonderful work of Mrs. Higgins, a general education teacher, and Mrs. Avansky, a special education teacher, as they utilize the co-teaching model. Mrs. Higgins and Mrs. Avansky co-teach during ELA, writing, math, and centers. They take turns introducing topics, leading the whole group lessons, and running targeted small group interventions. Both the general ed students as well as our special education students are reaping the benefits of the co-teaching model. Um, we're very excited to report the introduction of the Lexia Reading Program to our English language learners and some of our special education students. Lexia does not replace um, direct instruction, but supplements it while reinforcing skill development in the five areas of reading. You have here one of our first Lexia superstars. As students complete their um, levels, certificates are granted. Our department wants to highlight the wonderful work of Mrs. Meneguzo and Mrs. De Donato at Clara Barton Elementary. Um, they provide specialized instruction to our third and fourth graders. They support them in reading comprehension, written expression, math, and utilize the interventions of Wilson, Wilson Reading Systems. Um, during these services, they have developed a very creative, positive reinforcement program utilizing money. Students can learn, um, earn their dollars and shop or save their money. They're responsible for counting, adding, subtracting, overall keeping track of their funds. I think it's such a fun and motivating <coughs> program for them. At the middle school, we're excited to share the addition of Mrs. Merrow's Learning Lab. This is a highly structured classroom that offers individualized supports to students using multi-sensory, hands-on activities and project-based assignments. Social skills are embedded into the student's day as is a PBIS reward system to increase student participation <coughs> and motivation. Our intensive learning center at the high school, Project Success, has had a very exciting school year. They were rec recognized by State Representative McKenna and Frost for care packages they sent to troops in Iraq under Sergeant Major Jeffrey Sositis, whose nephew is part of Project S Success. And in November, the students were also honored with an American flag flown over Al-Assad um, Air Force Base in, in their honor. It's truly remarkable for both the students and staff. Also pictured here are students making breakfast from purchases they made at Walmart, volunteering at the Oxford Public Library, and touring, touring the Borough Candy Shop. Uh, Mr. Pietro's Career Up program is getting back up and running as they resume their community work. They work at Park and Shop, Dog Orphans, and Old Sturbridge Village. Mr. Pietro is also very excited and proud to report that one of his students has received her first paid job as a lunch and recess aide at Chafee Elementary School. Students continue to volunteer weekly doing different projects at the high school, and they've resumed their weekly involvement with Best Buddies, the pre-employment -empl program, where they learn about self-advocacy, job exploration, and workplace readiness. Pictures here show the students tending to the giving gardens there at the Oxford um, High School in the courtyard project. 
We cannot forget our related service staff, which consists of OT, PT, speech, nursing, counselors, social work, our BCBA, and our school psychologist. These caring individuals work throughout the district, providing support to students, staff, and families. We've highlighted four of the teams for this newsletter. We start with the speech and language team. Not only do they provide services to students with a variety of communication needs, but they support our complex communicators with augmentative and alternative communication systems, training our amazing instructional aides and teachers to, to facilitate that use of those devices throughout the student's day. Our BCBA, Ms. Maureen, Mrs. Maureen Soto, supports students, staff, and programs district-wide, analyzing students' academic and behavioral needs. She's there um, pictured with a student using a discrete trial training on a color program. Mrs. Grenier, our physical therapist, has developed an amazing motor curriculum to be used in our integrated preschool program for weekly motor groups. You can see the students engaging in these fun exercises, targeting core strength, balance, object control. Then the teachers integrate these exercises into their classroom routines for more practice and carryover. Ms. Connolly, our OT, and her assistant, Ms. Sharon, <coughs> help students with their fine motor, perceptual, sensory, and self-help skills. They regularly engage in inclusion services to help students access and help staff modify materials for students. Ms. Connolly also implements assistive technology district-wide. Using assistive technology helps students um, work around and compensate for their learning differences or um, dis difficulties. And overall, Ms. Connolly and assistive technology can increase the student's independence. We have definitely seen an increase of assistive technology district-wide since utilizing those Chromebooks district-wide, excuse me. And finally, we want to extend a big congratulations to two of our A students for receiving early acceptance to Quinn Sigmund Community College. We're so proud of both of them for the work they've done in school and out of school. Um, moving forward, we're looking forward to two big events coming up for the, our, our department uh, in April. This is, uh, Desi will be coming in for our tier focus monitoring. Um, we will be, um, they'll be looking specifically um, for us for licensure and professional development, parent student community engagement, facilities and classroom observations, oversight, time and learning, and equal access. So that's our rotation this um, three year um, tiered focus monitoring. And also in May, Futures of New York will be com completing an educational analysis or full program review of the student services department. It's um, it's an independent evaluation of spe the, our special education program and services and will provide the district with an objective report that identifies areas of strengths, needs, and recommendations. Questions? I just had one quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in the preschool program, mm -hmm. how, how many students do we have? Currently approximately 40. 40 in two separate classrooms, so we're pretty much full. Okay, thank Our you. Our three-year-old um, classroom was relatively small just because I think a lot of families didn't want their three-year-olds coming in wearing masks. That was a big deterrent this school year. You're right. Um, so historically it's been larger, but the school year and the previous year was much smaller enrollment. All right, thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, ILC, I'm assuming Intensive Learning Center? Yes. Okay. Is that... At, at the elementary level, I'm trying to judge by the picture so, here. Yep, so we have an intensive le learning center in all four of our buildings. Okay. So um, Chafee, Clara Barton, middle school, and high school. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about what that model looks like? Are those students centered in a single classroom most of the day? Are they included? Are they, what so does I think we like? can, uh, proud to say that um, each year our students are included more within the general ed classrooms. Um, it is a substantially separate program if need be, but we try to get our students out into the general ed as much as possible, as much as they can tolerate. Awesome. And be successful. We'll be giving you guys a more comprehensive update on the ACE program with the high school right yep. So we'll do that. Beautiful. Thank you. Looks great. Yeah. Anything else? <coughs> I just, yeah, I want to thank you, uh, Krista. This is well, well done. 
Um, easy to follow. I love how you just went all the way from the from the littles to the big. <coughs> appreciate that. I guess one question I have: the co-teaching model, as you alluded to at Chafee, um, really, really effective model. Um, what's ha is that happening still at the middle school and the high school? How, how does that look for so more I of that inclusion IEP students, the students that are more included? So I think what we're seeing is, um, as a department, I think we're very fortunate to have um, many of our special educators wanting to embrace more inclusive practices. I think as things have shifted, there is that um, tug of wanting to be inclusion for co-teaching, but also students requiring specialized supports outside of the classroom. So I think that's part of what Mr. Lucas and I would like to see from futures coming in, is to help us better look at our service delivery models, how we can provide our students with the most um, inclusive practices, while also providing them the much needed specialized support outside of the classroom. Yeah, oh, that's great. Thank you. Anything else from anybody? Thank you very much. Okay. I was just going to oh, say, I was, <laughs> was kind of trying to be a little bit quieter than normal, but um, <laughs> surprising, I know. I think this is fantastic. Um, is this the only program we have at OMS, um, the Learning Lab, or are there other programs that might not be captured? In, yep, so we also have an intensive learning cent center okay, as well. Okay, that's what you mentioned, Mr. Burke. And then I'm just kind of wondering, um, are there any thoughts for any other programs that you think that the district might need that you would bring to our attention, you know, through budget discussion and whatnot. I know we're always trying to plan to, you know, meet the needs of our students wherever they are, but. I think our big discussion, just like with everybody, is social emotional behavioral supports for our students. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if necessarily it's pro program based, but it's certainly something that we've been um, discussing a lot is the social emotional and behavioral needs of all our students from preschool all the way through our 18 to 22 program. Mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely in the works. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. All right. Katie and Phillips, Technology Director, is going to give us a department update. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk about what's going on in the technology department. Sorry, I didn't get, any, didn't get you any fancy pictures of our closets <laughs> or anything, but <laughs> I just kind of talked through it. Um, so as you guys know, we've been here um, you know, a couple times. Uh, we're a small department, um, basic response for everything. It is also, it's, it is fun to see when pictures do come in from the other departments where they're showing the tech in it, you know, to highlight that we're integrated in everything we kind of do in the district. Um, so our department right now, we're down to two full-time um, tech staff. We're hiring a part-time person. We had one person uh, who retired mid-year. Um, so, so we originally were two FTEs plus a half, a part-time person. Um, the full-time person retired. Uh, we had posted we really didn't get any good applicants. Um, in that process, the person who was part-time decided he wanted to go full-time, which worked out great because he was already trained. So he basically slid into the full-time position. So we have currently have two full-time technology assistants um, um, you know, with myself and um, and Suzanne, there's a lot of data um, work for our department in terms of reporting and so on. Um, you know, those happen October, March, and June. Um, then we have other reports that we typically have to do, like your your school attending, CRDC, which are civil rights, uh, which is a big. If you your data people in your districts, you may have heard um, it is a, it is a painful report that we have to submit every couple of years. So uh, <coughs> so we, we finishing up that and um, rolling into the new, in the new year. So Said we're looking to hire. We have a, that, that posting out for that part-time position now. Um, we have a couple of applicants, and we're looking to interview this week. And I think we have a couple of good ones in the mix. So, so hopefully we'll get that set up, um, especially at this time where we're rolling into MCAS. So um, all the you know all the testing is going to be done online. So we're basically prepping for that. Um, everything's going to be done with Chromebooks. That's always been our uh, the push to get more and more devices into the buildings, um, so the kids can be on Chromebooks. Exciting to say, uh, I walk around the buildings and we see kids K through 12 on Chromebooks. Um, we're we're a true one to one right now, um, which is really really exciting. Um, well the the process we've been doing is, for testing you need newer devices um, that, that won't be supported. So. All the newer devices are basically going to the middle. Well, we, um, really, barring three, three through um, 
10, really, um, because, it, you know, some 10th graders may have to take the MCAS, but um, the, those students who are older than that or the kids in younger grades, they'll get the older devices. They still work. It, it does everything they need to do. Um, but as I've mentioned in the past, we, we um, through our budget uh, discussions, we do have to make sure we have um, a line item, which, which we were hoping to keep in the budget, to make sure we, we can replace those <coughs> devices as they come off support over the years. Um, so um, th right now we're in good shape. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely get through this year. But um, we have our plan is um, if the funds are, are available or, um, or if they're approved, then we get additional Chromebooks that will replace the other devices that get off support at the end of, of at the end of this summer. Um, we have uh, interactive projectors in every room. We've done installs for that. Um, we talked about a couple of room changes that are, that are potentially happening. Right now we're going through um, if there's a room that we're converting that potentially may not have had the tech. We're trying to get ahead of that because there, there are still supply chain issues. Um, so we want to make sure we get those ordered as soon as possible so we can get them in before day one of school. Um, you know, adding, adding wireless, make sure our wireless is, is in good shape, again, to support testing or to support everyday use. Um, and uh, you know, prior, uh, you know, a couple years ago, as we were starting to roll this out, I remember like testing days would be kind of running to rooms to make sure that the Wi-Fi worked. We don't really need to do that anymore because they're using it every day. So um, we, we've been filling in those gaps as they go along. So, so on testing day, it'd just be a normal day, fire up your Chromebook, do the test. Um, working with the schools now to do the infrastructure test just in case, we'll, so we'll swap out all the older devices that are out there because if they're not supported, the kids are going to log in, <coughs> decide they would on the day off, and also just to give them that opportunity to, to, to get in that testing mode, uh, making sure their Chromebook uh, or the device works, the Chromebooks, and, um, and then you know, also test the Wi-Fi just in case. So, so, so we're, we're just kind of being proactive in terms of getting ready with, with, um, with what's going there. Um, we did have some capital funds to update our switches. Um, this got approved a few years ago, and um, you know, so we're looking to spend that money right now. We have an a E-rate um, bid out of 470 out right now. I don't know if you, how much you know about the process, but typically we'll basically put, it's through federal funds. Uh, we get a 50% discount. So we're, we're looking to, um, to use to leverage the funds that we have for the town to basically upgrade the, the back end switching. Um, think, you know, it's things that people don't really see, but it, it's, it's things that we want to make sure that they're, they're constantly up and running because if they're not calling us, it means things are, things are typically up and running. So, so hopefully we'll, we'll get the, that funding approved. Um, the price is starting to come in, and I think we'll definitely have enough funds to cover that. Um, and do that over the summer, hopefully, um, so everyone comes in and everything just works. Uh, you know, magic most yeah. of the times. But hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll get that. We'll get that going. Um, the we, we last time I was here, I think we talked about a technology audit that we did, that we had with the outside um, agency that came in. You know, continuing to review that, looking at at things that we can improve. Want to talk to Mr. Lucas about it. We, we do need to put a, um, one thing, one of the goals for that, for me more than anything else, was to create a long-term technology plan for the district. Um, and that's a great starting point because um, with those outside eyes. But I wanted to hold off on that until Mr. Lucas finished his strategic plan. So the, the, the technology plan will be aligned with a district uh, strate um, strategic plan. So look forward to, um, we'll probably um, be soliciting helpers or, or, or board members to help with that process um, in, in, in the next school year once we, st once we start working through that. So overall, uh, you know, we're, 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 in a, we're, in a, we're in a good shape um, where we, you know, we continue to, to add devices as needed, um, you know, with, with, a, with a small team. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can stay on top of it moving forward. And, and thanks for all your support throughout the years. Thank you. Any questions, board members? Just very, very grateful for all that you do. I mean, you make it look easy, but we know it's far from easy because you seem to be everywhere and do everything, and I don't know how you get it accomplished, but you do, and it's amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Yeah, I agree. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank Just a couple quick questions. Yeah. Uh, devices, I know you said we're pretty much one-on-one -on -one across the district. Are those available to go home at all levels? Yeah, so um, so the, the different schools will, <coughs> will have different strategies. So the middle school through high, they'll, they'll have them go home. Yeah. Um, they, we had the elementary school students bring them home, but the teachers um, felt, especially after coming back from remote learning, they wanted the kids to be off the devices. So <coughs> they want, they, so, um, they keep the devices in the room. Um, so every room has like a, a class set. 
and yep. the teachers kind of charge and they're all assigned to the student and whenever it's time to pull up you know go on a um, like ST math you, you you probably heard about some of the programs that are yep. offered they they have assigned Chromebooks where they'll go in and, and jump on that okay yeah. So and and, and it, it has sped up things. So we, even at Barton, um, we um, with the the flooding that we're dealing with, we had to uh, rip apart the computer lab. And then Mr. Quinn said, "Really, we don't need that computer lab anymore because the kids all have their devices." So so that's kind of where they're, they're being used. Um, so that model is kind of out the door. So it just frees up space and everything else too, and then we can use those computers somewhere else. Okay. So to your knowledge, they're not requiring any online work at home. I guess my yeah. question or concern is if that's the only access a student has, are they able to take them home? I guess we can ask Mr. Quinn in a yeah, few minutes, yeah, too. Yeah, pretty, pretty <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I don't remember us talking much about teacher devices. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, all the teachers received a laptop over the summer. Um, so we, 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 we purchased a laptop over the summer <coughs> for all the teachers. Um, and again, um, that, that's also part of budget conversation. Right now we're good, um, but again, you know, it's going to become obsolete in a couple of years. Yep. So we do have to make sure we have s some form of replacement um, plan in place for that. And also one thing that I also forgot to mention, as part of ESER, we, we do have a, a instructional tech specialist, which we've been finding again for many years to have in a district, and that position has just been great because now we have someone really working with teachers um, on a daily basis, training and, and, uh, and learning the programs that they're using. Um, and um, so. Def definitely invaluable um, addition to our department and, and what we're trying to do. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, and that position <coughs> needs to somehow get into right. the general budget. Uh, right. Hopefully that's a, a vision and a plan. Um, question about cameras. I mean, for somebody who's been fighting for five years in the building I'm in to get cameras, um, it's a great, great asset, especially at the secondary level. How will we maintain, like, do we have a plan to maintain those? I know we, you know, we got the money from the town. My concern is, <coughs> as they get older, like, do yeah. we have a plan to, to fix, update, because they're, yeah. they're important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we're actually at that point right now where where we do need to do an upgrade. Um, we're we're pricing it out. Um, basically, the software that we use to run the cameras. So the cameras themselves um, are it's just a regular camera it just sits there Mo most of the cost is coming in where the, the it has to go to a server that gets recorded and everything so we're at a point now where the software is out of warranty Justin and I are working on a, on a way to um, upgrade uh, upgrade that in the future okay. um, it if a camera breaks typically um, we can fix it uh, we actually just went over and uh, replaced one at, at Barton the other day uh, you know so we, it's a lot of it, we do a lot of in-house repairs as opposed to sending it out because that, again that would be a, you know a couple hundred dollars so so we try we try to keep as much of that in house as we can, um, but but yeah, uh, it, it it is on the list. We definitely want to make uh, you know, and we and we do have, I know we're probably two two fifty even, uh, you know, cameras out there, you yeah. know, uh, or two hundred to two fifty somewhere in that range, yeah, because we keep adding as as needed, and we do have a couple places that we know we need to add more, as, especially the elementary schools, because in the past we really weren't. <laughs> we didn't yeah. have many incidents happening in elementary school, but and, yeah. and we, we've seen a few in the past couple couple months. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anything else? No. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Katie. Thank, thank you. All right. Next time I'll bring some pictures of the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Mr. Quinn, Principal Clara Barton, going to give us an update. And before I uh, begin, I do need to thank Caden because, like you said, Palmina, he's everywhere. I don't know and how today he, he was it. in, uh, at least Barton, on the one of the most challenging days is to come back from the weekend when the clocks are on. <laughs> oh. uh, he had that fix in about eight minutes, so um, he's like MacGyver. <laughs> the only way I can describe him. Um, I know there's a few pages in your packets, but I'm going to actually start with something that's not in there, and that's some good news about getting back to normalcy at Clara Barton. Uh, over the weekend, uh, Ms. Tatro's class and Ms. Gilligan's class moved out of the library and back into their original classrooms. Uh, fresh tile, paint, a carpet, new furniture, um, almost back together again. So the library uh, is... It looks very bare, believe it or not, but like uh, Katie said, we're not going to put the lab back. Uh, we're going to figure out some space creation and uh, figure it out. So Mrs. Mayo is working on that as we speak. And uh, this upcoming weekend, 
Uh, the other third grade, Ms. Tortison will move back. The OTPT room will move back. And the reading department, which is currently using my office, they will all be moved back. And the preschool, which right now one room is housing both programs, they will go back. So by ne middle of next week, we should be all back to normal. So I wanted to take some pictures of that and show you today, but I didn't, but I will the next time I come. So uh, it was like the first day of school today because kids got to use the hallway that <laughs> couldn't use and we'd have to cut to the library and it just was a little little extra pep in the step. So, and the rooms look great. I can't thank uh, Service Master and everybody that's been um, helping the Barton Project along. They've really been doing a great job. So. Uh, I'll just stop there. Any questions on the move or anything like that before I... It's okay. phenomenal news. Just, yeah, no, the kids were great. I know Ms. Tatro was over the moon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very excited. Uh, and what I have in front of you is just some highlights. Um, as you can see in the fourth grade, there's some students on the chalkboard solving some math strategies, but I also want to uh, make sure we highlight that we started our second round of morning math support last week so every tuesday and thursday we have about 30 students uh, that come in for extra math help so uh, this is round two uh, it's teacher recommended and just about everybody participates so um eight o'clock you can see 30 students on tuesdays and thursdays um, learning extra math we have four classes going right now uh the next person uh needs no introduction if you have anybody at barton but that is bambi uh, Bambi came to us uh, as our uh, therapy dog and uh, we, Mrs. Hutchinson worked with Mr. Truax. I guess Bambi has been coming to the high school for quite some time and Bambi is a rock star. Uh, Bambi has made two visits. The first day Bambi went all around the school to every class, met everybody, said hello. Yeah, Friday she hung out in the office and anybody that needed a Bambi visit came down and visited Bambi. So. She's the most passive, likable dog, um, and she's been great. So it's really been a hit with our students at uh, Bambi the therapy dog <laughs> comes to visit. Uh, Mrs. Sims apologizes. Uh, you know, the art department, she feels visuals are certainly uh, necessary, but she did this quick, and she will, uh, as, she, as she will, um, go up to central office and do some replacing of the artwork that's up there uh, a big thing that we do and you may know this if you're in school is a square one art it's a big fundraiser so uh, she took that on that has all been finished and um, our gargoyles and uh, molas are all being uh, finished as we speak and and as mrs. Sims says life is good in the art department she is um, she's a rock star and uh, Mrs. Mayo, as I said, is starting to create her space, but she is certainly doing her due diligence teaching library skills and computer skills. And that is Melville Dewey right there, um, founder of the Dewey Decimal System. So uh, we still do a little bit of that at Clara Barton. I know it's easy now just to go to the main library and punch it in a computer and get it, but uh, doing a little good old basic facts here and um, you know playing her game library bingo and and all <coughs> sorts of uh, fun book facts and she's excited that the kids will now be back in the library be a little more circulation uh, taking out more books uh, with the students she's doing a lot of uh, digital footprints and what it means to be a good digital citizen as we all know it is <coughs> truly important uh, when you are online so she's teaching the students to be uh, responsible on media and you know uh, it, it's fun. when they go in they actually talk about secure passwords and write them on the wall then the kids have to try to remember them because as adults we always forget them and write them on sticky notes and uh, doing things like like that and um, the fourth grade has this uh, interland which is also teaching students uh, good habits in their everyday lives and you can see the uh, smart, alert, strong, kind, and brave. Um, uh, you know, when you're on the computer, share with care, don't fall for fake, secure your secrets, it's cool to be kind. You know, basically what we want kids to know, don't give out too much information and be cautious. Uh, the picture that you see down the bottom uh, of the four staff members, uh, the three staff members from Barton and Ms. Trainer. Uh, on Friday, they presented at the Massachusetts School Administrators Pre-K-8 Conference um, 
the intensive intervention model in the science of reading. Uh, it's basically what we've been doing K to four, uh, starting, and, and these four ladies knocked it out of the park. We, uh, there was a full room of about 30 people that came to see how we do reading or how we're doing this portion of our reading. And um, they really did a nice job talking about the, how we set it up from start to finish. I know we, we talked about it, the, well, they talked about it at the conference that we are you know, through cycle three, but actually we're almost completing cycle six. So uh, they got some good feedback from other districts, lots of questions, and uh, people were curious how we do things. So uh, big shout out to those four for putting that uh, program together. And just some follow-up, I know uh, we're trying to increase our parent home communication. Uh, I think they came up at one of the last meetings about you know, what we're doing with each students during each cycle. So uh, notes have been going home, uh, book bags are going home. Uh, you know, for books that are just right for kids, and we are just, uh, you know, these uh, these people really just want everybody to have a love for reading. So that is that. Uh, grade three, as you can see, we celebrated Dr. Seuss Day, and a rite of passage in elementary school is when you dress up as if you were 100 years old. Uh, you can see some of the students there with the curlers and uh, reminded me of my Aunt Mary back in the day, to be quite honest with you. Uh, it was very, very nicely done. We had a lot of fun with that. Uh, and you can see up the top there with the picture with Miss Tatro and Miss Gilligan. Um, those are some dividers that we bought uh, for, for the library when the, those two classes are in there. Uh, now we're going to sort of repurpose those space and use those for our little MCAS dividers when we have uh, seven or eight <coughs> breakout spaces where we need students for. So. Um, so we will be putting those to use uh, as well. And then down the bottom you see an animal report on uh, elephants as uh, the students have been you know, reading and doing all sorts of different things and doing their research projects there. It's their little portfolios that they put on their desk um, when they are finished. Um, I know I mentioned MCAS. One thing Acadian's helping with, we have to do um, an infrastructure test which we are doing next Wednesday. That is making sure all the laptops work and sync with the school. And that, well, I remember last year we didn't have too many problems, but uh, we are ready to do that and we are ready to go. So I'll stop there, answer any questions or anything I didn't cover that you'd like more information of. Please. Any questions or comments, Mrs. Forbes? Mine were all comments. Congratulations on getting your classrooms back. That was actually quicker, I think, than we anticipated, wasn't yes, it? Yes, we were told five <coughs> to six months. Right. It certainly hasn't been that long. So. Yeah, which is excellent. Um, quick question about the Tuesday, Thursday extra math. Who's teaching that? Is that? Classroom teachers. Who come in early? Yes. Okay. And they get a stipend for it, but they, they come in and, and do that uh, starts at 8 o'clock. Okay, great. Um, I love that digital citizen. Be a good digital citizen because I think those skills are so important for students. So congratulations. Good job, Mrs. Mayo. You know, if we can continue reminding students of that, maybe keep them out of trouble down the road. And uh, I'm, I love that parent communication you have for the reading intervention because you have the word lists and the parent letter and the book bags. And as Mrs. Griffin was saying at our last meeting, more is better. So oh, sure. That's great. And one thing I know we use a program called Bark, which alerts us if, um, you know, a student is on an inappropriate website or something like that. Mm -hmm. We don't get nearly as many as we have in the past. So right. Well, knowledge working. is power, though. And yeah. when they know the dangers and the reasons behind it, maybe they're less likely to try it out or to fall for tricks. I hope so. Yes. So that's awesome. Thank you. I'm thrilled. I love what Mrs. Mayo is doing. It makes me think of the di digital uh, literacy frameworks that everybody's supposed to be teaching now, you know, all the way from elementary through high school. So it's neat to see it starting with our little people. And um, kudos to her for doing all that. I, and I think, obviously, everything that everybody's doing is it's just phenomenal. And it's great to see the pictures. I'm psyched about the math program, partial to math. I can't, I can't help it. But That's okay. I, <laughs> Yeah, I give a lot of uh, credit to the teachers to even sign up to do that before <coughs> school with, did you say 30? About 30, and I have to say, this came right from them. Yeah. Um, we had a staff meeting a couple of months ago, and, and Tara Trainer was there and said, what are we looking for? And they said, we would love to do a before school math program, and 
Here it is, uh, that's round two. That's so outstanding. Awesome. I'd like to hear that 30 you know. kids want to come, too. I mean, that speaks volumes about the teachers, that the kids are so, you know, excited that they're showing up before school to do Yeah, math. and they make it fun. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's not like they drill and be. kill at 8 in the morning. It's really, yeah. they sit at their tables and they do it, and it's, 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 awesome. it's a nice program. And yeah, they're very smiley kids in those photos, so it's fantastic. They love math. They love math. I love it. Okay. So thank you. Sure. Anything else, Mr. Burke? Just congratulations to your intervention team. That, that, that's awesome. They're out there representing Oxford at the MSAA conference. Yeah, it, it was nice. It was nice to see other schools taking notes and saying, oh, how'd you do that? How'd you do this? You yeah. know, and, and then, of course, you know, how are you going to sustain it in the budget? And all these, you know, the questions that come naturally yep. with it. But um, it, it was good. They did a great job. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Another great. I, I love how all this is laid out. You guys have all, all the presentations tonight have been great. Just very easy to follow, great information in it. And I'm going to echo what all my colleagues just said to some degree. I, I love the fact that we're talking to third graders about their digital footprint, being a good digital citizen. It's huge to get the kids to understand that early on. I mean, they all have devices in their hands. They're probably using cell phones more than some of us as adults. So it's really great that that conversation is starting and happening, and hopefully it sustains because uh, it's important. So great job. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. And just want to say one thing. I know you, you commented about the format. A uh, full disclosure to Helen for that. Uh, I sent her about eight pages, and she condensed it to this beautiful three. So <laughs> Bless I, you, Helen. I'm not taking credit for that. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Great job. All right, thank you, Mr. Oh, Quinn. Set. Thank you. Yep. Thank uh, you. Student rep uh, Molly Raymond is out sick today. So, Molly, we hope you get better. Uh, we do have some meetings, uh, meeting minutes to approve from February 28th. Do need a motion for those minutes. I have one item to like discuss as um, sure. sure. Maybe and I could be wrong. Um, so it's Chief Elementary School update, um, and there was comments about uh, reports that came home to parents. All reports were sent home to families. I don't know, and I could be mistaken if I station data was actually shared with parents or not. I feel that that might not be the case. So. Yeah, it's, it seems to be, and I could be mistaken if I'm reading this incorrectly, but it looks like this is saying that that type of data has been shared with families. I don't know what your take is. Yeah. Right. So I just feel like that needs to be reflected that I believe Dibble's results possibly was shared. I don't think iStation has come yet, and I personally would love to see that data for all grades that are participating in that program. That's all. So we can make, if there's no other um, issues with the minutes, we could approve it making that change. Mm -hmm. You captured that change, Helen? Yes. Okay. So I make a motion to accept the minutes with Mrs. Griffin's change. Second that. All right, any more discussion? <coughs> Call for the vote, Mrs. Forbes? Yes. Mrs. Griffin? Yes. Burke? Yes. I'm um, yes, four yes, one absent. And it's passed. Uh, Superintendent <coughs> of Schools, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Lucas. Okay, thank you. Uh, you have a copy of the latest draft of the calendar in front of you. Um, the election day for the state has been moved from September 20th to September 6th, which is a Tuesday. Uh, so that then moves our professional development day from the 20th to the 6th, um, as we're trying to keep elections out of our schools as much as possible while we work with the <coughs> town and the state electoral commission to possibly explore new voting sites in Oxford, but um, that is the major change of this version. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the calendar. I'll change. second that motion. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Call for the vote, Mrs. Forbes. Yes. Mrs. Griffin. Yes. Burke. Yes. I'm a yes, four yes, one absent. Personnel update. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mackenzie Corvo and Caitlin Pacetti uh, finished their, their jobs on Friday. That was their last day. We want to congratulate Mackenzie Corvo. She's also a licensed social worker, and she begins at Quaybog uh, Regional Junior and Middle and High School next week. Um, so we want to wish her the best of luck. She was our guidance secretary. And we have Mitchell Croner starting uh, today as our ELA long-term sub at the middle school. And Amy Overstreet is joining us as our ELL instructional aide to help those students. Um, she'll be working district-wide. So we're happy to welcome both of them to our team. Uh, any questions, anybody? 
Not in those changes. All right. All right. Uh, the Mr. Kevin May and I, our athletic director, had discussions about <coughs> the M NFHS broadcast program. They're willing to st install three cameras for us, one in the gym, one in the stadium, and one at the middle school, um, so that folks can watch our athletic teams uh, from anywhere in the country by, by, by purchasing a subscription. So if you want to watch your kids play basketball, but you're away or at work, this is a great element for grandparents. There's no charge for us to install the cameras. If anything goes wrong with them, they come and fix them. Fix them. Um, and so it's a nice opportunity for folks to see their kids play athletics. This is happening all over the country. About half of Swickle schools already have these installed and it's been beneficial. Um, we have a lot of parents who work multiple jobs. It's a chance for them to take a break at work and watch their kid play soccer or basketball. Um, so I just wanted to let you know about it. It's something that, that we would love to do um, and have that for our families. So it's an optional program. Nobody has to subscribe to it. But if you do, then you can watch high school games anywhere. It also allows you, if our kids are playing at Quaybog, you could watch that game because they have these cameras installed. And any other school where it's installed, you can watch your kid play even if you can't be there. Mm -hmm. And so we'd like to have that option for our families. Questions? Take any questions on it. Mr. Burke? Um, we're covering all the fields outside, the football field, baseball field, soccer field? We're able to cover everything except baseball, softball. So. Okay. Kevin May met with them already, and that's what they were able to do and agreed okay. to do and technology-wise could do. Gotcha. So, okay. But the gym would be basketball and volleyball, yep. and then it would get all the fall sports. It's just baseball and softball. And middle school, too, you said. So we get yep. the, the middle school games. Yes. Awesome. Anything on that field hockey field will be watchable. Okay. So. Awesome. So what is the cost for the subscription for parents? It's ten ninety nine a month or sixty nine ninety nine for the whole year. <clears throat> it's up to parents. So you could just do it for a month if you wanted to, or a couple months, um, and go from there. It's, it's optional. So I guess, I think it's neat. I just think of so many people, though, that might not be able to participate in it that would want that desire for their kids. And if that's something that we're thinking of doing, is there a way we could do it creatively where our students are able to do it and it's, you know, streamed online? some other way i know we have a media program ha at the school i know it won't be if they're traveling right right but if they're, it's a home game i wonder i don't know i don't like commercializing our students sports but i do want access it, it's wonderful people. if you have extended family to live elsewhere in the country yeah. grandparents who are snowboarding um, or things like that it's a great opportunity for them to see friends and family playing <coughs> sports at a very limited cost so it is something we'd like to to offer. Is there a uh, I'll say this the right way? Is there a, like a minimum subscribership that they need? No, to, it's on, that's on there. Up, Once it's up. installed, it's up and running. That's it. So right. and is it like a year contract, a five year? Like how is it year to year? It's, how do they? It's op it's open ended, and they they guarantee all repairs if something goes wrong. So they're basing their profit margins on subscriptions. Sure. They're hoping that 50 Oxford families a year will buy the 1099 for a couple months, and that they're happy with that. Yeah. So, no, I, I think it's great. I just I can yeah. speak personally. I know my parents would do that because they're in Florida and right. can't watch my girls play basketball. Right. So I think it's yeah. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Maybe to Pal's point, yeah. maybe we look down the line to some families who may may not be able to afford it. Maybe somehow internally we create a yeah. program that can can get them the subscriptions yeah. if, if needed or something like yeah. that. I wonder, I think, would they know. raise costs on us? Like, is there a, an agreement that it's going to stay at a fixed cost, or is it something that they, like, bait you in, and it sounds great, and then you find out later, then it's... This has been, this has been like around cable. for a while now, four or five years, and it, I think it's pretty much stayed at the same cost. So, but either way, it's optional. Right. It's yeah. optional. Yeah. This isn't, nobody yeah. has to do So that. you don't need yeah. anything from us, right? Nope, I'm just, just, I'm just, just making you aware of it. And if you have, have any questions or concerns, I'd like you to ask me, and... We're gonna we're gonna go ahead. All right. yeah, that's no, okay. I like it. I think I mean, it's we great. All, I think, okay. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next. What do you got? Okay. Um, <laughs> you have the MSBA. The vote. We want to thank our uh, board of selectmen for approving that. We're hoping to get our roofs done at Chafee um, and Martin <coughs> that are repaired. I just wanted that in your packet so that you're aware of that. Um, didn't know if it was a unanimous yes. vote. Four zero four zero. So which is terrific. So we're moving forward with that. Justin Ledoux has done a lot of work around that. 
Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to talk about, um, the project success t citation that uh, Mrs. Miller referenced. I got to be here when Representative McKenna was here. It was wonderful. He presented the kids with the citation. It was an awesome moment. The kids were so proud. They've done such a good thing for other people, our soldiers overseas. Um, and I just wanted to congratulate them and their staff. It's just a wonderful group. If you're ever walking that hallway, please pop in there. It makes your day. It's awesome. It's a great program, great kids. Uh, but it was wonderful to see our kids commended for all their selfless behavior. So it was wonderful to see that. So I just wanted to mention that that's in your packet, too. So. Thank you. Any questions for the superintendent? Well, we have him. All right. Next order of business is the community service number two uh, winner. So uh, I'd like to announce the winner for uh, the service community service award number two for the 21-22 school year is uh, Joseph Petrzak. So congratulations, Coach P. Uh, we will be in touch with him and hopefully have him at our next meeting. So thank you to all those who participated and uh, look forward to giving him the award and then I think we're going to do another one, correct? We'll do a third one. I am going to just skip over the superintendent evaluation process right now. We'll come back to that at the end. Let's do our subcommittee reports. So, uh, Pal, I know we have a few to... Yeah, we have a few policy... So I'll turn it over to you. Policies to review this evening from the policy subcommittee. So we have policy JD purchasing. And this is um, a revision. I believe that we looked at this before. Correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like we had this in, in our packet. It's a complete overhaul. Yeah, so um, Mr. <coughs> Ledoux, we do have a manual that we use for our business department that Mr. Ledoux worked on tirelessly. And it's like a, a best practice for us now um, that I'm really proud that we have due to all of his efforts. And um, through discussion and insight that he brought to us, um, these numbers and figures that are here that are associated with our federal grants and, and um, different things tied to purchasing, they change and they're constantly kind of evolving. So um, he made a, a very good point to the policy subcommittee that every time that these things, you know, change they need to be updated within the policy mm -hmm. and so one thing that he brought to our attention was you know it, it's probably best that we are in line with um, MASC's recommendation for this policy so that's where it comes from and um, it does reference the fact that we do have a financial um, policies and procedure manual um, and we have you know internal control manuals for our grants and we again have all those things that we continue to reference um, so we can go to those manuals to see what they say, but they can be kind of updated without the whole policy subcommittee having to sit at the table to make that happen. And they can be current. So that's kind of why that, that is in front of you this evening, just striking all that um, previous language around federal grant procurements and other, you know, very, very specific language that does change more frequently than we uh, could probably imagine. Um, and then there's another policy, DKC, expense and travel reimbursements. And um, we did look at this extensively, and um, this has been something that's been an ongoing discussion for us. Um, and we just have to kind of be prudent and best stewards of our finances. So we do have um, some new language here around mileage that will take effect uh, next calendar year. So. That brings your attention. And then we have, of course, our face covering policy again, EBCFA, for another review. And that's all. Right. Any questions? We need to take them one at a time. So one at a time. Do we, can we do them all at once? Waving, I'd rather waving. do them. Want to do them one at a time? If you want to do them one at a time, you can start sure. them. So anybody want to make a motion? I would, I would like to make a motion to accept policy DJ as written. Wave the second reading. Waving the second, wave the second reading. And waving the second reading. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Call for the vote. Mrs. Swarbs? Yes. Mrs. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Burke? Yes. I'm a yes, four yes, one absent. 
I'll make a motion to accept policy DKC and waive the second reading. DKC? Yep. DKC. D I'm sorry, I thought you said E. I got confused. Um, I'll second that motion. Oh, we have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? I just yes. have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so with the change for the people in the town of Oxford, we have staff who do half their day here and half their day there. Is that written separately for them, or will it be beginning on July 1st? Because they actually, that's, that's their whole job is traveling between right. the two schools. So if any travel happens outside of the town of Oxford? No, nope, I'm talking about. No, I'm talking about, yes, this this is effectively as of July 1st, we are no longer going to be having such reimbursement um, because it is in town. So everything that is in town will, will no longer um, have those <coughs> expenses reimbursed uh, between our buildings. If there's travel without out of the Oxford, um, then we will look at that based, um, you know, I believe it says right here, outside of Oxford, Massachusetts is authorized mileage reimbursement and payments. Um, it came to our attention that um, consistently having to look at all these different types of reimbursements coming, um, it's very tedious, very time consuming. Um, and looking at you know best practices for districts all over the Commonwealth, it's not something that other districts do. Um, so we're trying to put ourselves in line with other communities, best be best stewards of our, our you know our our money, and um, that was the decision that was made as of July first, twenty twenty two. So I guess I feel bad for like uh, instructional aid who's district wide. And she could be traveling up, down, and all around Main Street. And I know our schools aren't that far apart. But, but with gas being, you know, for something a gallon, I feel bad for people who do that daily as a part of their job. So that would be my one concern. Mm -hmm. But th there is language in there, though, that, you know, unless uh, it could be negotiated. Well, that's what I was just going to say. So negotiations, now we're into the contract. Correct. This is individual letters, which we can't really do with the OEA, which the instructional aid would fall under, correct? Oh no, she's under yeah. IAs. But it's still a contractual issue. Right, right. I mean, right? You, could put, well, you could put general language potentially in there that says if, if somebody has to travel within the district, you could you know, negotiate individually with the superintendent. Yeah. Right? Some per travel stipend. Travel stipend. It's a set rate, yeah. and really it's to stop the constant reimbursement at the IRS level, the different mileage, the calculations, all that stuff. Right. And I do okay. think to, to Pal's point, I've never heard of a district that does this. I didn't realize we did this. Oh, yeah. I looked that deeply into it. So. Oh, I see them on the warrants, and I just assume it's the people who you know have the shared schools and that they put them in monthly. I don't yeah. really look at yeah. how often they go in. I just figured that's who they were. It's very often. It's very forever. tedious. <coughs> and, uh, it could be, I think, a full-time job for somebody to just consistently <laughs> process these reimbursements. So again, you know. There's opportunities for these things to be discussed in a different way and for us to, to probably do it more practically if it really does impact somebody greatly, you know. Okay. So. Thank you. So we do have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Thank you, Mrs. Forbes. Anything else from anybody? Call for the vote. Mrs. Forbes? Yes. Ms. Griffin? Yes. Her? Yes. I'm a yes, four yes, one absent. And one more. We don't have to waive it. This is our second reading, so whoever would like to make a motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we accept policy E, B, C, F, A. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second. Any discussion? Yep. Um, the second paragraph, I feel like we're really imparting our opinion here. According to the public health experts, which I think Mr. Burke I talked about it at our last meeting as well. I think that's kind of a little a statement that's really, as I said, imparting our will. And I'm not sure I like doing that. And then also under the mask will be required in all school health offices as required per the discretion of the school nurse. The as required just confused me a little bit. Who would that be required by? The nurse. The nurse. Right. Amy's discussion about if a student comes in 
let, let's say with the with the broken leg, she's not going to ask him to put a mask on. But if they come in symptomatic, she is going to ask him to put a mask on. I, mean, I think it's just right. a little redundant. It's the wording is what I was questioning, yeah. You just say per the discretion of the school. Oh, I hear you. Right. I that was really more the wording that confused me. Yeah. I didn't know if someone so else was requiring. Strike as required. If we could strike. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. A second as required. Yes. Exactly. I thought we did talk about striking some of that language out of the first paragraph you had mentioned. Well, I think that second paragraph, I think we're actually, where it says, therefore, in accordance with the guidance and recommendations of the CDC and all of that, we're actually not taking their recommendation and guidance. So I think it's disingenuous of us to say that. Right. That's what I mean. I thought we had struck part of that. I thought out. we did, too. I think um, we, I thought I we did, to too. I don't think I have my notes from us. Um, all right, so where are we at? We had a, we're still Motion in discussion. Still in discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my suggestion would be to strike the second paragraph. I would second that. I feel like, and again, we are listening to <coughs> the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education because that's why we have masks removed right now because they said that they could be lifted. Mm -hmm. and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. So those two entities we are kind of taking marching orders from because um, we, we followed their, you know, recommendation to lift the mandate. Um, and again, I just don't know if you'd want to leave that language in there if things did change. I think the reason for this is because things are so fluid we just right. don't know what could happen so you know it could come from a federal level it could come from maybe one of these entities maybe it doesn't but once you strike that language it's not there for us to refer back to but I think um, if we strike out the CDC and the Mass Department of Public Health and leave in the guidelines from DESE um, and then we do have in there the following requirements are in place until further notice so if things do end up changing Obviously, if it becomes federal or statewide, Desi would make the command and we would follow their lead. But I'm not so sure, as I said, the <coughs> CDC and the DPH. Well, what if we, well, I, I think the d what, if we, what if we just got rid of the first sentence and then got rid of therefore and we just say, in accordance with guidance and recommendations from the CDC, the Department of, uh, from Desi and the Mass Department of Public Health, the following requirements are in place until further notice. And we just take out the opinion part there at the beginning about masks are the best way to stop it. If we take that line out, yeah. uh, I think the rest is fine. Sorry. I don't know, I'm just making a suggestion. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm fine with it. I just, what I was trying to say is when you look at what we've left, right. we're actually not following exactly. the guidance and saying recommendations of the, of the CDC or right. Desi. One of the best ways to stop it is to wear a mask, and we're saying it's optional. No, no, I'm sorry, Dave. What I'm saying is with what we've left in the policy, and reworded, we are actually not following the guidance or recommendations of DESE because of DESE and DPH's guidance was everything that we eliminated. You, you follow me? But no, I understand. That's why I'm just saying I feel like well, it's no, disingenuous to say we're doing that. I don't, the if you don't leave it, to leave it. wear a mask and me. we're saying optional, so that's also kind of, yeah. kind of, I, I, I do, yeah, I see what you're saying, but we are taking some of the, we are taking their guidance and their recommendations we've just adjusted adjusted them for our needs yeah, to our yeah that that part doesn't all right so we have a motion and a second we're in discussion phase if we want to strike something out then we're going to have to rescind the motion and somebody's going to have to read a new motion so who made the motion Corey. i did so i'll rescind that motion all right I resend my second. All right, so we're back to. So I will make a motion to accept EBCFA striking the first sentence in the second paragraph and the as required in the second bullet. I'd second that motion. Any more discussion? We call for the vote, Mrs. Forbes? Yes. Mrs. Griffin? No. Mr. Burke? Yes. I mean, yes. Three yes, one no, one absent. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Griffin, for those you are uh, welcome. updates. All right. Personnel and negotiation subcommittee, anything, Mr. Burke? Or Ongoing. <laughs> Ongoing. Okay. We have another one tomorrow night with SEIU as our first one, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah.
Okay. And teacher ongoing. Doug is OEA is ongoing. Mm-hmm. All right. School buildings and safety. That's Molly and myself. No updates from us. District Accountability and Curriculum Subcommittee. Any updates? We are meeting, I believe, tomorrow evening. And we will hear some great updates. And then we'll have more updates for you. <laughs> awesome. Lots of updates. Lots of tomorrow. updates. Can I just ask yes. a question, Chair? So the, the, we've had some questions lately about some of the purchases we've made and, and things that we're purchasing. So that one of the charge of the data and accountability is to review proposed substantive changes to curriculum and adoption of related instructional materials. Is the intent of this body, just for clarification purposes, as we move forward in trying to adjust uh, best practices with our staff and support them, does that mean that, that data and accountability in the past has vetted every book that's come up? Or is it just major changes, like if we change the math program for five through eight or something like that? I'm just looking for some clarification as we try to move forward. Sometimes we want to act quickly for our students and our staff when they're excited about a new book or a way to opportunity to get the kids. So just looking for some re reflection. Well, I guess I'll defer to some of the more senior members of our committee. I mean, from my interpretation <coughs> is it's we approve curriculum, right. not necessarily books. That's what I was going to say. Books. I think so it I don't is. Know. If it's a major curriculum change, we would have to look into that. Is that go ahead. Yeah. Oh. No, go first. Or you can fight. <laughs> <laughs> I think in this particular case, the concern is the books may constitute a change in the curriculum. Okay. If you follow me. I, yep. I don't believe it's in our purview to approve every book and, right. and say you can buy this, you can't buy that. Right. I don't, but I think my view point of it is this may be a change in what we're teaching as far as okay curriculum goes that or new curriculum yeah or right. possibly a new curriculum right. especially at a particular grade level okay okay and i think you know it's always been in the school committee's purview <coughs> if it's a you know part of something like the uh, course of studies uh, anything that's policy related so if it's something that is you know curriculum and it's a sensitive topic it's something that we should have input on because we're representing the community and we just kind of be, need to be mindful in that. Um, I know we've had discussion in the past. There have been top, you know, brought up by other members if there was a summer reading book that was controversial and it's come to our attention from parents. That's been something that sometimes we have spoken up. Um, just kind of wanting to hear from the teachers and the, you know, the administration why they feel that's a very valuable topic to discuss with the students and I think whenever there's anything that might be potentially controversial that parents should be aware that that is um, going to be introduced with their children and they should have the ability to opt out if they're not comfortable with such discussion okay. um, but those decisions should be made at the building level that that's that's the that's the responsibility of the building principal to get this information from department heads Mm -hmm. and or teachers depending what grade level it is and then you know having it be vetted out by the curriculum coordinator and uh, the superintendent I mean that's really not our place at that level I feel like you were right that it should go through the principal and it should go through the superintendent and the superintendent should be aware of it I think you know it's always a kind of a muddy area but sometimes it does come to our attention in a way where we're caught off guard uh, God excuse me caught caught off guard as school committee members by reviewing warrants or looking through things and saying wow we're purchasing 50 new books these books are about a, a concept that could be controversial you know if i review something and it comes to my attention that it's new in the, our curriculum i'm going to speak up about it i feel like that's my place because it is curriculum um and it's a controversial touchy area well I mean there's a difference between curriculum and the resources right I mean you're, you're talking about the change of, if you're talking about a change in uh, the teaching of a standard or, or, or but if a it's skill, a standard that's not at that grade level and that's not part of the frameworks and it's being introduced to our children yeah well, well that's a whole different conversation yes it yeah. is yeah. so that's yeah. where I'm speaking from yeah. so then I guess if, if you see red flags on a, on a warrant I emailed you, you were aware of right. them. And then and we go to the superintendent right. and then he, and I he gets follow that reading. chain of command. Right. Yeah, no, which you did perfectly. Yeah. yeah, and I will continue to do. Yeah. So I think that's where that conversation stems from. And, you know, I don't like to get overly involved in things. I just want to, you know, help everything. But we are kind of checks and balances sometimes. And there is gray sure. area. 
it's hard. I don't like to. Well, I also think in a day and age where uh, <coughs> any change or adjustment to what you're doing in your practice is going to be under a microscope for lots of different reasons, that, you know, people vet all that out with their department heads, their lead mm -hmm. teachers, their principal, their curriculum coordinator before you make any substantial change. Yeah. I would agree. I mean, you know, I've just been fielding some stuff from, from parents just today about some stuff that, uh, you know, was presented in class, but they just weren't educated on what it was. But once we talk, but you're, any change, you're right, is and I just uh, feel like, a red flag. Yeah, and it comes to us usually through our course of studies discussions. And, right. And then we're, you know, we're not here to say, no, you can't have X, Y, and Z. But, I mean, we are here to kind of be letting everybody in the community be aware. Right. Yep. And so people have their, they can exercise their, um, you know, their freedom of choice for what they want their child to be educated in because ultimately this is my opinion as a school board member i don't feel that it is our place to educate children in all areas of life i feel like parents should have some autonomy to say i don't choose to have my child educated in certain things Correct. at this age no, and everything we purchase needs to be connected to standards we all agree absolutely on that. no question no. so yeah okay. All right, thank you. All right, uh, where were we at? Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is Forbes. Uh, so we ended up having to cancel our meeting last oh. week due to a lack of attendance. Uh, two meetings in a row, we would not have had a quorum. So with a membership of 21, it's we hard. need to have 11 people there and unsuccessfully. So Helen told me that it's not a legal meeting, we might as well cancel, which was a little disappointing to some of the people who were coming. Um, but on the topic, and I'm not sure really if you want to hear this, but no. um, the anonymous alert that we have and being a part of the diversity and equity and inclusion subcommittee, um, I'll just use hate speech. And there is a lot of that being reported. <clears throat> we need to make sure that all students feel safe, that all students are included, welcome, accepted for who they are. A lot of that, as Dave said, is a lack of education. Mm -hmm. So I feel like some of the things that we may need to do for our students might fall under the discussion that we just had. So I would like to continue some discussion on that at another time when we have, when I have a little bit more information about um, some things that I know are in the works. Yeah. So again, I, <clears throat> because if the teaching isn't coming from home, on topics that are difficult. And the children come in, the students come in, and they're young, I totally get it. I'm not saying that at all grade levels we should be teaching <coughs> all of these different life things, but at some point it does become our responsibility for the safety of the students we have, as well as creating good citizens who will go off and be inclusive and not be judgmental and not be stereotyping and that kind of thing. So I think my DEI self will have to ask for more discussion on that. Yeah. Could I ask uh, uh, to, through Helen, um, is there a way to take some of the members on her committee and make them like reserves or alternates so that the quorum can well, be met? Like so. What, what I ended up oh, doing, Dave, um, we have quite a few members who we seem to conflict with schedules. So I put out an email last week when I canceled the meeting asking, you know, I understand that schedules get busy with such a large committee. We are required to have a large number to create a quorum. Um, if there are any people on the committee who don't feel they can continue or for whatever reasons Wednesdays are no longer a good day, please reach out to me. Not one. Not one person has emailed me back. So I'm not sure if they don't want to be on, if they don't have the time to be on, or if it's just coincidental that two months in a row, because we don't usually have that problem. That's what I was wondering, is there a way to like shift time. 10 of them to like I don't know if there's a way to label so. them alternate. Yeah, so sure, that way you just have to get five for a quorum yep, as opposed to having to get um, can do that um, based on the chair. If you come back and make a recommendation that based on the attendance of these members, mm -hmm. you would like to, to move them to an alternate spot oh. to reduce the quorum number. Okay. The school committee has to do that. Okay. So next meeting. Perfect. Thank you. That way, at least you can get, you know, mm -hmm. if you get all 21, great, but if you get yeah. six, you know, you're Right, four, right. So that'd be great. Right. So. I mean, I would certainly suggest that as a courtesy, you give those individuals yes. a heads up. Right. <laughs> of course, yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So that would be it for my committee, subcommittee. All right. Um, why don't I have you do the uh, warrant report, Mrs. Griffin, and then we'll go back to 
Sure. So I have a warrant report for this evening, March 14th, 2022. Um, signed three warrants, a payroll warrant dated March 3rd, 2022 for $659,570.45. An accounts payable warrant dated March 8th, 2022 for $72,736.28. And in another accounts payable warrant dated March 15th, 2022 for $217,457.21. And that is all. Thank you. Mrs. Griffin. Um, <clears throat> so then back up to the uh, superintendent evaluation process, it's something you know, as a principal, I'm starting to get a little nervous because I have all these <laughs> summatives and, you know, everything coming down the line and it just MCAS and it catches up. So I started thinking the other day about the process here. Um, it's been a few years. Like, I, I know I haven't done it yet and I'm in my third year So um, due to COVID. So I just kind of wanted to make sure we were all on the same page, have a discussion. <coughs> um, a couple things I looked up. I know in the past we had a policy that was... Um, pretty strict as far as timelines. Right. Uh, we have changed that uh, policy, so we really don't have any timelines um, that we need to adhere to other than, uh, I would say, the courtesy to any members who are up for re-election. Um, so if we were going to do the process, I think we would like to have it, in my opinion, and I'd love to hear from all of you, mm -hmm. have the process done before the last meeting of the potential uh, person leaving right. because they should be part of that evaluation right. process. Right. So that would be the only thing we really have to look at for a timeline. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out and see if there's anything that feedback on that or any thoughts about that. No, I think point. that's a great point because the newbie coming in is like, huh, what? I don't think I want, you know, it's overwhelming, I'm sure. And if you don't have any information because you haven't been around, it's unfair. So looking at, so looking at meetings, um, we have, today's the 14th, so we have March 28th, we have April 11th, April 25th, May 9th. When is the elections in town? Do it's you right around, yeah. So we would really should have to target the May 9th meeting to, to do the final I think year. we have to be very careful to, to abut it so close. Because if there is anything that is a, you know, a topic of discussion that goes more than one meeting, um, then the person that is up for re-election might not be back at the table, and their voice can't really come. We could always to the table. could we we could call for a special meeting, right? We could we could announce another meeting sure. prior to the transfer of the new person coming in potentially. Who's up just, for re-election this year? I think it's just me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's just me. Um, <clears throat> so why don't we we plan for the ninth? Very good point, though, pal. But I do. Th We've we, lived through it before. So. I think we have wiggle room if we have to. Um, we could we could call a Wednesday or Thursday meeting the following week, or just schedule something to follow through. So if we have May 9th in our our heads, that's when we you know obviously we'll get it to the superintendent in advance, give him time to review, and then we will certainly have that discussion um, publicly. I feel like, too, again, I, mean, I would just advocate that it's sooner than May 9th, even though that date sounds so quick. Um, just because I know it has to be looked at, and in the past it's been something that has been, you know, all of the evaluations come to one person who compiles everything and kind of rates everything and puts everything in one final summative document. It's not just... A different document for each of us. It's a compilation of right. And that's that's kind of what I want to talk about. That's what I want to talk about next to kind of see how we can streamline that. See how we can. I, I guess I would be again thinking as doing a lot of these and knowing how time consuming it can be. Just when I'm doing it myself for one staff member, never mind having to compile mm -hmm. five of our opinions all together. It's going to be a lot of work, which I'm fine with. I don't mind. I mean, we could. I just think the long, if we can get it to the ninth, it just gives us more time, and then we can always schedule a meeting for the tenth, mm -hmm. right? As an as an extension meeting if needed, and then if we don't need it, we just can cancel it. Correct? Sure. Yep. So we can we can schedule in advance to have another whole night to discuss. 
and that would be the only thing on the agenda. So do you want them do the ninth to you? You want a clearly like no, two no, they will. will then, the ninth is when we'll present. We have to okay. come up with another timeline. When, I just want to be when very they need clear. need to get to me no, no, because that would be when the final report was due. Yeah. I yeah. just want to make sure that yeah. we're yeah. talking the yeah. same language because I've heard we're this discussion this before, and they, we were not talking the same language, and then people were like, <laughs> well, "Oh, we're, we'll we'll all be on the same okay. page." <laughs> so yeah, the ninth to the ninth to present publicly. We can schedule the tenth as a as a back you know as an additional night if we need further discussion um obviously i'd like to get That's it to mike there's nothing in mike's contract that says we have to get it to him by a certain time but i think past practice has always been giving multiple days right? oh yeah ahead of time absolutely right. so would, would we say we'd want to get it to him if monday's the ninth do we want to get it to him by monday the second gives him a week is that good with you mike yeah, it's fine. And then. So to you by the second. If you guys no. No, to the him by the, by the second. So if you guys could get it to me by the twenty fifth. April twenty fifth. Yeah. Okay. It is close. <laughs> okay. And the other thing. You know what I'm doing over vacation. So I think <laughs> Helen gave us a pretty comprehensive packet, but if you go to the to the end part of it, um, the one that's got superintendent and district administration rubric updated 2019. So we are, are using the new superintendent evaluation model. <coughs> Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did anybody go to that learning lunch? I know you all work 12:30 in the afternoon, but nope. I I I. I was on it but in and out of it and right. um it is up on the msac website you can watch it yeah uh, and it was actually good information yeah. it makes it sound much easier than it actually is though yeah. that's the only downfall so if you look at so and again i apologize if, if some of you know this but if you look at you know the first page i think it's i don't know Roman, i don't know what are the little lines with the dots on top roman numeral two it's two yeah, so if you look at if you look at the structure, you have standards, indicators, and elements, right? So if you keep <coughs> flipping and you go to the superintendent district uh, administrator rubric on page one, there's the four standards which we have to evaluate the superintendent on, and then the indicators. So in like in standard one under instructional leadership, there's A, B, C, D, E, F as indicators, and then the elements are the numbers under those <coughs> indicators. Delicious. That's the same for standard two, standard three, standard four. So Those are the little things with the check marks. So what I what I what I traditionally do as a, an evaluator of, of teaching staff is at the beginning of the year we identify um, elements. Certain we well we end up identify indicators and in certain elements that we're going to focus on in each standard. But everything's evaluative. So I didn't know if it if it's for our committee. Do we want to look at focusing on a few of those elements in each standard kind of have that be our driver of the evaluation in each standard or do you guys just want to have the whole scope because ultimately it's all about it. evaluate this mr burke yep I'll just give you a different angle so what what i do in completing mine is start with the goals well yeah. Yeah. And once, once, once we've yeah. once we've done our our uh, evaluation of the goals if that already covers these pieces we don't do that again so I it, I may say for standard one indicator C please see evidence from goal number or whatever and not write any more about it right you know what I'm saying right right because um, what I find is a lot of times once you're done with the goals you've covered almost all of this maybe is that backwards bit. design? So goals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I kind of think I wouldn't want to pigeonhole anybody personally as a <clears throat> committee member if they want to speak about a certain, you know. Well, it's all open for evaluation. It's right. all open for yep. evaluation. It just helps you streamline. And to, right to Corey's point, the goals. You know, we have to we have to evaluate the goals um, as well. Uh, but to his point correctly, if there's components in that that touch upon any of these uh, indicators or elements, then obviously 
you can, let, you know, you can. Like from what I remember, it. his goals are going to cover family and community engagement because that was a big part of his right. entry plan. Mm -hmm. So that whole standard might be right. taken care of once we write up our evaluation. So then we'll just leave it as that all four standards with all the indicators and all the elements <coughs> are on the table, yeah. which they were anyways. We don't want to hone in. It's, it's probably easier for individuals to do that anyways. Right. So we'll just leave it at that. I think what will happen is when that summative piece comes together, when everybody's kind of, you know, whoever is in charge, I'm assuming it's you, Mr. Chair, yeah. is going to kind of compile all that, then, you know, everybody's input will kind of be there in a certain way, you know? Right, and that's part of what I, I'm going to watch the training again, but that's what I was trying to watch is just how do you, how do you incorporate five different... Mm. Especially if they say different things. Right. Opposing things. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I think you kind of take the average. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the challenge, and um, you know, I'll certainly see some guidance on that. <laughs> so, so I guess the next question for me, I guess through Helen, is how in the past how have like I do this all electronically? How do we do this as a committee? Does every committee member get a hard copy of an evaluation form? Yeah, it can either be uh, it can either be a hard copy and they can handwrite, or I think there's an electronic version online. They can save as a PDF and send to you. Um, just keep in mind that all five individual evaluations are part of the personnel Correct. file as well as the compiled. <coughs> right. So all five go to him, and then the the, the final one that is well, the created. final one goes to him, but the other it goes five in his file. Right. Okay. Yeah. So do I send out the? Because I'd like to get. Um, the digital version out to people. So Ace, right. can you get that out yeah, to everybody? I think it's also on MASC's website, so you can just click it and download. Oh, I just tonight. I would prefer it to come from one source, so that if she sends it, we all get it. Um, I certainly would prefer it being done electronic. Would be right. fabulous. Right. <laughs> Cut and paste is a that works beautiful, for me. Uh, beautiful tool. Yeah. So okay. So we, any other questions or comments? How would the committee like um, the superintendents? That sounds like a lot of work. What's the what, easiest for the right, How much evidence, the evidence do you want? Preference in the superintendent. Not too much. <laughs> no. I feel like we've got a lot of evidence because we have everything that has come electronically to us through the whole year. Um, all the packets and all that, I look at as evidence. Um, if you have anything yeah. specific that you want to give us, like okay. I've taken it in paper version before and like a binder. Or maybe just create a Google. Google uh, file that you can just warehouse stuff in. But to that point, which I found really interesting in that training was a lot of, one of the, there was a superintendent on there. He was talking about how when they drive their agenda, it's really focused right. on their meeting agendas is focused on the goals. Yeah. So any, any documents, he just puts hyperlinks into right. it so that the members can just go back and there's all the evidence. It's already there, but that's, that's usually what I do for myself. I take my packets from the, the first meeting all the way to the end, and I go through every single one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So electronic uh, evidence, and when when do we need the evidence from the superintendent? By what is the timeline? Just so we can have a few timelines because that right. is important. So we're submitting ours you to you to by, by the twenty fifth. Right. April 11th, too late. I'm just I'm just on a Monday train, but that doesn't mean we can't skip off on Mondays. April 11th will be here before we know it. Right, no kidding. I was thinking. When, what's the vacation the week? End of that week. The 18th week, to the 22nd. That's the following be vacation. 11th sounds fine to me. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I'm like, pal, I'm probably going to do it over vacation, so for me it would be too, as long as I, I have I it by that Friday <laughs> to take a little pressure off of Mike. That would, that would be better. Great. More time, the better. Friday, <laughs> There's a lot of Friday other stuff going the, on, too. Uh, Friday the 15th. Friday the 15th. Yeah. I, I just can't see myself Friday working on it with everything else that's going on. Before no. yeah. What's that? Friday the 15th is a holiday this year. It's a good Friday. Good Friday. So it would have to be Thursday the 14th? Well, he can just, that's his oh. deadline. He can get it to us. Gotcha. All right. The internet still works. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So evidence by the 15th. Um, you all will get me your final document by the 25th of April. I'll get it to Mike by the 9th. Uh, no, wait a second. Second. 
second. Second, right. And then Mike the second, and then we're talking about in public the ninth, right? Right. right. And just to clarify on his evidence, just a yeah, a sheet with bullet points yes. that says yeah, I mean we don't we don't need you to write in paragraphs long of each okay. thing. Like you and just put samples of evidence in there. Yeah, if there's hyperlinks to the yeah, time. If you want okay. to put links, uh, okay. Yeah, I agree. different documents and stuff. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Bullet, bullets are yeah. you know, fine. Bullets don't need to write a novel. Nope. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions about the evaluation? All right. Uh, members forum. <coughs> Mrs. Forbes. Well, I missed my Molly report, so I don't have a lot to say. <laughs> um, but I'm super excited for the ACE students who are going off to Quincy. Congratulations to them and also to the staff who have worked with them and have gotten them to that point. And uh, also congratulations to Coach P on his uh, community service award. Yep. Thank you. Mrs. Griffin? I'm looking forward to hearing the update about our ACE program. And um, <coughs> I appreciate everybody's hard work. Uh, to Mrs. Forbes' point that you made earlier um, in the meeting, I think you would be happy to hear that we did have a nice um, event where our students did get to speak their voice and did get to, you know, speak up for their peers at the high school with the um, <coughs> the walkout that was done, and I think it was tastefully done, and um, I heard some very, you know, positive feedback from the students feeling like their voice was able to be brought up and unrespected and um, I think that hopefully you know would make you feel feel good that people are getting That's their voice event, out though. that is an we event need to have a mindset yes I think I think mrs. Forbes you might not give people enough credit that there is a lot of mindset there I give people credit. I don't know <laughs> I hear from a lot of people I, I bet you do but um you know I, I still feel like we we got to be careful. It's that delicate balance where we do have to give parents, you know, they are ultimately the first educators of their children. I agree with that. And um, and I think every child develops differently, and we have to be very reflective of how, um, you know, what they're able to comprehend at certain ages, um, emotionally. I and totally I, agree. And I think that's where my just my concern came from. I totally agree. Yeah. We'll continue that discussion. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. So that's all. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Mrs. Griffin. Mr. Burke? Uh, I think it was nice to hear from Katie and again about the independent tech audit and then from Kristen that we're having an outside agency do a special ed program review. I think it's that's awesome awesome to open ourselves up and have people come in and say, thank you. Here's what yeah. you're doing well and here's what you need to work on. We all need to do that. Yeah. So. Be yep, those are great processes. So appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And again, I want to highlight the uh, interventionists presenting at the MSAA conference. That's yeah. that's great for us for Oxford awesome. and, and great work on their part. Yeah. It's great to see they were working the day before how nervous they were because they're presenting to adults instead of kids. Right, so right. It's always a mind Big difference. Shift. It's a difference. Yeah, they did a great job. Yeah, um, yeah. A <coughs> lot of uh, what my colleagues just said. I, um, you know, kudos to all the great things we heard tonight. But I, I was really. I don't know. It was just I was just thoroughly impressed with all the presentations today. I, I, just, I know I said it after each of them, but I was just really impressed on the data. It was well laid out, easy to follow. Um, you know, Mrs. Miller, that, that was probably one of the best special ed overviews I've heard. And to, to Corey's point, really love the fact. I think it's been over eight years, nine years since we've had that. So I think it's well past uh, due. So I'm glad that that's happening. Um, so yeah. Uh, great job to everybody who came out tonight, and I, if I was unable to make uh, the military ball both times, I had events that was canceled, and the yeah. next one I couldn't make it either. Yeah. Do you want to give us a little update on how yeah. the NJRTC um, military ball went? Because I, I don't think any of us were able to make I it. I didn't get to go. Yeah. I was I, there in spirit. I, I heard a lot about it coming into it, and it, it was awesome. It's great to see the kids all dressed up. There's a lot of different military for net formalities at each step of the way, which I'd never seen before. It was really neat. Um, the kids run the, really run the whole show. Our advisors do an amazing job preparing them and working with them. Um, but it's really student-centered. It's a really neat activity that they really run the show and the whole processes. Um, I was walking the classrooms a few days later, and just like uh, they said, they were breaking down with the kids. Okay, what went well? 
what was okay, what do we want to improve for next year in military fashion and breaking it down. So learning didn't certainly end in all the preparation that went into the ball by the kids. And then they pull off the ball and then they analyze it after just like which is good practice that we do. Yeah. Um, but it was an awesome experience. I would recommend that if you guys have a chance to go next year, try to go. Yeah. It's fantastic. Kids were amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Great Thank event. You. Thank you for yeah. sharing that, Mike. Yeah. I, um, thanks. I appreciate that. Awesome. Um, future topics. Oh, no, final public comment. Um, I do not see anyone in the audience, so do I have to? I'm going to open up the floor for public comment. Not going to read the whole paragraph because there's no one there. We're going to close the floor for public comment. Future business. Uh, any uh, agenda topics on the top of people's heads right now that you want to share? All right, if not, get them by the end of this week or early next week but before wednesday uh, next meeting is march 28th uh, we do need a motion to adjourn i make a motion to adjourn do we have a second a second all right call for the vote mrs forbes yes mrs griffin yes mr burke yes i'm a yes four yes uh, one absent have a great night all right thank you thank you